If there's one aspect about Zelda games that make them so iconic, it would be the roster of characters that Link has to interact with on his journey. The Legend of Zelda is a legend after all, so it makes sense that the series is full of memorable characters that make playing the games a unique and fun experience. Out of the hundreds of characters across the dozens of Zelda games, there is no surprise that we've got some really weird ones. Whether it's a result of game developers trying to add some comic relief in their games, or a result of the developers being purposely cryptic to allow fans to formulate their own opinions on the motives of some certain strange characters with unknown backgrounds. Regardless of Nintendo's motives for including these oddball characters, there are sure a lot of them, and I think it'll be fun to cover the weirdest character from every single Zelda game ever released, including the spin-offs, and I'll even cover some honorable mention characters where I see fit. There's a good chance you've never heard of a lot of these characters, so make sure to strap in, grab a snack, and stick around until the end of this video to not miss out on some really strange and interesting characters. So with that, let's start covering these characters, starting with the Zelda game that started it all. Kicking it off with The Legend of Zelda for the Nintendo Entertainment System. For a game that came out almost 40 years ago, this game actually has a decent roster of characters and more than others in this video. One honorable mention for the weirdest character goes to the friendly Moblin, who is a secret hidden character in the game that can be found throughout the overworld by bombing secret passageways or burning certain trees. Despite where you find him, his dialogue is always the same where he says, it's a secret to everybody, as he gives you a fat stack of rupees. When I first played Zelda 1, I thought the Moblin was giving rupees to Link as a means of rebelling against Ganon, but I think another possible theory is that the Moblin is bribing Link with rupees so that he doesn't have to fight Link, and the Moblin wants to keep it a secret because he doesn't want his Moblin buddies to judge him for being a coward. I kind of like the second theory more to be honest, because it's funnier, but despite the secret Moblin's motives, you can't deny how weird it is to see in the game. For my number one pick for the weirdest character in this game, I'll have to go with the old man. Yes, the same old man who gives you the starting sword, the same old man who gives you hints throughout your entire quest, and the same old man who's constantly one step ahead of you, teleporting around the map right where he expects Link to go next. So yes, this character is so strange because he's basically everywhere, appearing in caves and dungeons where Link needs him the most. Honestly, I kind of think this whole saving Princess Zelda from Ganon thing is an inside job hosted by this old guy because he seems to know Link's entire quest inside and out, and he can be found in pretty much all the dungeons. I also think it's kind of strange how when you try to attack him, he uses his mystical wizard powers to summon fireballs to attack you. Also, the weirdest and most absurd thing about this guy is that in some instances when you uncover secret passageways in the overworld, he makes you pay the quote, door repair charge, which is honestly kind of petty of him, and I was borderline in disbelief when I stumbled across this scenario when playing this game for the first time. So with that, let's move on to the next game. Next up we have Zelda 2 Avenger of Link released for the NES. This game has a significant increase in characters compared to Zelda 1, but right off the bat, I'll have to say that most of these characters are weird because most of them are literal copy and paste of the same person walking around. Like there's no way these are two different people, right? They say the exact same thing. Two honorable mentions are the old and young lady that you find in multiple villages that <clears throat> heal Link when you <clears throat> come inside. I'm not sure if the developers or localization team had anything lewd in mind, but it definitely sounds like Link's getting down and dirty with the townsfolk behind these closed doors. Also, most of the time, the lady that heals you is in a red dress, which symbolizes something that would definitely not allow this ESRB rating to fly, if confirmed. For the weirdest character in the game, all that go with the NPC, Error, who sports the infamous piece of dialogue, I am Error. When people who dislike Zelda 2 try to provide examples on how this game sucks, they often quote this guy as the reason, where they claim that his name is a developmental error or something. This is actually not the case, but the meaning of this guy's name is actually not as clearly laid out as one may expect. Later on in the game, you meet a guy named Bagu, which is actually the Japanese word for bug, like a computer bug or glitch. When this game was translated from Japanese to English, the guy named Error was translated to English from the Japanese word Era, but they forgot to translate Bagu to the English word bug. So the English copies of this game didn't carry over the joke of the duo being named Error and Bug. All we got was this random guy named Error. This explanation really shines some light on things, but I'll have to admit that I was thoroughly confused when I came across this guy in game while playing, and he definitely takes a spot as the weirdest character in the game for me. So let's move on to the next game. Next up we have the first ever handheld Zelda game to ever be released, the Zelda Game & Watch. This game is very simple, where it just consists of combat-centric rooms that you progress through until you save Zelda at the end. This straightforward game has a severely limited character roster, where we just have Link, Zelda, and another interesting character that takes the weirdest spot for this game, where we have the little old lady, who acts as an alarm clock for the system. In order to sell the watch gimmick of the Game & Watch, a lot of these systems had built-in alarms, where you're able to have an alarm go off at a certain time of the day. In the Zelda Game & Watch, this alarm takes the form of an old lady, who appears on screen and waves her magic flute around. 
An alarm clock is super basic and elementary by today's standards in gaming, but this old lady is one of the rare instances in Zelda games of breaking the fourth wall, which makes this lady strange and interesting in my opinion. Literally the only fourth wall break that I can think of in Zelda is that one phantom hourglass puzzle that you have to close your DS to solve, which makes this old lady stand out as being unique. Also, I think it's kind of weird how the manual says that she's waving around a flute when the imagery shows her waving around a magic staff looking thing. Come on, Nintendo. Where's the consistency? Oh well, moving on to the next game. Next up, we have The Legend of Zelda Own to the Past, released for the Super Nintendo. This game actually has quite a bit of strange characters that you may have forgotten about that are found in the Dark World, where we have this weird Kirby looking ball thing that gets kicked around, this weird looking octopus alien thing with a ladle that you can find at one of the minigames, and this Mickey Mouse looking sentient hand thing in a cave. An honorable mention for the weird character that's not actually found in the Dark World is this purple bat thing with fangs that you can find in a cave, called the Mad Batter. You may have noticed this outright, but what makes this guy so interesting is his name, which is a clear reference towards the character in Alice in Wonderland, called the Mad Hatter. The similarities don't stop at the name though, where the two sort of act similar to each other. In Alice in Wonderland, the Mad Hatter acts all eccentric and rude and provokes Alice during his tea party. In A Link to the Past, the Mad Batter mimics his behavior where when you find him in a cave, he acts like he's going to punish Link, but it turns out when he casts his spell, the amount of magic it takes for Link to use items gets reduced by half, so he ends up helping the player instead of screwing them over. The character that takes the weirdest in this game for me has to go to the one that's rather hidden away, where we have a human cuckoo. In Kakariko Village, if you go to this house left of the bottle salesman and pick up this pot, you can reveal a cuckoo. This is definitely an odd sight to see, but if you try to use your magic powder on it, it transforms into a full-blown woman that you can talk to, where she acts surprised that she's now a human, and confronts Link on his cuckoo murdering tendencies. Also, she explains how the weathercock at the center of town that you use to teleport around places is the one responsible for sending cuckoo swarms at the player when you hit a cuckoo with your sword one too many times. This is obviously an absurd situation, but I guess it's better than being able to catch cuckoos on fire Link's Awakening with a magic powder. Also, I think it's pretty funny how in the Game Boy Advance release of Link to the Past, weathercock was changed to weather vane. Keep me a classy, Nintendo. Now on to the next game. Next up, we have The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening, released for the Game Boy. Link's Awakening is an odd game, where a lot of our characters are Mario references, talking animals, and catfishing goats who pretend to be Princess Peach. One honorable mention for a weird one goes to the shopkeeper, who is secretly the most overpowered character in the game, where he electrocutes Link if he gets caught stealing, and he then gets called Thief by all other characters for the rest of the game. Another honorable mention goes to Crazy Tracy, whose name is oddly fitting for a weirdest character list. She lives with rodents, and she offers Link a potion for rather cheap that he can rub all over himself and when he dies, he gets automatically revived. Why would Link need to lube himself up in some mystery ointment? Only Crazy Tracy knows, apparently. And I don't think I want to know what strange substance she has brewing up in there. For our weirdest character choice in this game, I'll have to go with the great and honorable Windfish, who has talked about throughout your playthrough, but you aren't able to see the Windfish for the first time until the ending sequence of the game, and this thing honestly looks like something you'd see in a fever dream. It's all decked out in some psychedelic looking outfit, and by this point, if you weren't convinced that this game takes place in a dream, you would believe it now. Also, I think it's pretty absurd that Nintendo chose the largest sea creature in the world as being a thing that flies in this game, and I can't get over how tiny its little wings are compared to the rest of its body. Also, I think it's pretty funny how the windfish is inside an egg during the game, when whales are one of the few sea creatures that don't actually lay eggs in real life. That's just the cherry on top for the absurdity with this guy. So with that, let's move on to the next game. I'm so hungry, I could eat an Octorok! Next, we have the first of the three infamous CDI Zelda games, Link the Faces of Evil. And honestly, pretty much all the characters in this game can be classified as weird, based on the animated cutscenes alone. The cutscene frames look like they were all drawn in Microsoft Paint, and the animations look exaggerated, where the characters keep zooming in and out constantly, to I guess add a stylistic 3D effect. It sort of reminds me of old school 1930s cartoons, where movements are exaggerated and not realistic looking. I actually kind of like these cutscenes and don't dislike them nearly as much as other people, but I'd have to admit that they are strange to see in a Zelda game. Pretty much any character could take the weirdest character spot, but one honorable mention goes to Horgum, who is a wrinkly, dusty resident of a lighthouse in the game. You don't see much of him in this game, but his voice sounds weird, probably due to his constant smoking damaging his vocal cords. Hi, hi, hi. For the weirdest NPC in this game, I'll have to choose the bodacious lady named Alora, who asks you to get her necklace from the big Shrek looking guy. And honestly, this lady is creepy right at the outset when you first meet her. Like if I saw this lady coming up at me all up in my grill like that, I'd be out of there in a heartbeat. Also, what makes it even stranger is that when you give her back her necklace, she says that her husband gave it to her, but he's an Abominom now, where the Abominom are the poop flinging baboons they had to fight during the game. I'm not sure why she tells you this bit of information. I think she might be hinting at Link that she's single now that her husband got transformed, which definitely makes sense after you see her give Link a big sloppy kiss. Also, I can't get over that pop sound effect that happens when she whips out a bottle to give Link. Here. 
Like, what kind of orifice did you take that out of to make a sound like that? Honestly, I don't even want to know. Now let's move on to the next game. You've saved me! Next, we have the sister game to Faces of Evil, Blink the Wand of Gamelon, which was also released for the CDI. All the characters in this game are super odd as well, based on the same animation style of the cutscenes. And I'd say that the character that takes the crown as being the weirdest has to go to our good buddy Grimbo, who is some wizard guy with beady frog-like eyes. He looks weird, sounds weird, and honestly, his voice sounds like nothing you would expect. Bring some hand, you spore, if you want a bit more punch! He sounds like some old witchy lady. I'm pretty sure the devs cheaped out on the voice actors in this game, because there are multiple characters that sound exactly like Grimbo here, where we had this creepy crazy-eyed lady. Bring some fairy dust and I'll make it a magic cloak. And the shirtless homeless looking blacksmith guy who looks like a walking bottle of brown Heinz mustard. Hey, bring a heat crystal. I'll fix up your sword. Like there's no way these three characters have different voice actors. Now let's move on to the next game. Radical dude, totally. Next, we have the last CDI Zelda game, Zelda's Adventure. Similar to the two previous CDI games, this game has a lot of weird characters, but the characters that are strange in this game aren't really weird for the right reasons. This game had a pretty botched development with a low budget, where many of the characters were not voiced by actual voice actors, and were oftentimes voiced and acted by random people they found. One of the key characters of this game, Zelda for example, was literally played by the office's receptionist. The voice acting is notoriously bad in this game as well, where a lot of the clips sort of sound like they were just taken in one take and put into the game. One honorable mention for the weirdest character goes to this lady you interact with towards the beginning of the game that says, Trust no one with hair. <laughs> Don't even trust me. <laughs> I've stolen one of your lives. <laughs> she tells you not to trust anyone with hair, including herself, and makes you take half a heart of damage? That literally makes no sense. Like, how does someone having hair have anything to do with trusting somebody? Also, the only way I know this is a female is because of the voice acting. You can't really even make her out as human based on the visuals alone. There are a bunch of other characters in this game that don't make any sense like this, but the character that takes a weirdest spot in this game for me is one that's actually an Easter egg, where we have Skater Dude. Yes, a guy skating around on a skateboard in a Zelda game. If you go to a specific screen of the game and use a specific item, this guy skates across the screen and says, Radical Dude Totally. Radical Dude Totally. This may sound pretty random, and it is, but this guy actually has quite a bit of lore to him. This guy is actually from an unreleased game by the developers of Zelda's Adventure, called Food Dude, which would have depicted a skater guy who rides around and has to avoid junk food and cigs. This voice line and sprite is actually pretty much the only known surviving elements of this unreleased game, and this easter egg in Zelda's Adventure was actually discovered recently, where it was unknown for more than 24 years. I would say that's surprising, because it's not like it's that hard to find. You just have to use a specific item on a specific screen, so you would think that someone would have found it earlier. But considering that this game sold horribly, I guess it kind of makes sense that it took so long to find this easter egg. So with that, let's go on to the next game. Now we have another obscure Zelda game of BS Zelda no Densetsu and Nishi no Saikaban, which translates to Broadcast of Teleview The Legend of Zelda Ancient Stone Tablets. This game only saw a lot of day in Japan and was released for the Satellifu add-on for the Super Famicom. The characters in this game are very similar to the ones and look identical to the ones in A Link to the Past, but one new character that honestly feels kind of strange to see in a Zelda game is the Mole, who is a helpful creature that can be found in the overworld. And once you talk to him, he tells you the location of treasure located somewhere else in the overworld, where you can find a crap ton of rupees. This character doesn't seem that weird on the surface level, but the more you study his character model and how he walks, he just seems odd. I can't get over his bloodshot red eyes, and I can't shake how much he reminds you of that creepy murderous mole that you had to fight in Earthbound. They had the same eyes, shape, and put their hands up in the same way. And when I first came across this guy, I thought he was trying to lure me into his tortured cave dungeon to do some unthinkable things. Or maybe I'm overthinking it. It does seem kind of odd how this guy has accumulated such a large amount of rupees though, and how he's willing to give all of them away to Link. So now let's move on to the next game. Now we finally have some more familiar Zelda games, where next up, we have The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, released for the Nintendo 64, which has a few strange characters that I want to talk about. One honorable mention weird character goes to the Carpet Merchant, who is a shop owner that's sort of hidden away, where he can be found in the haunted wasteland, where a constant dust storm covers the land. I can't imagine how the heck this guy thought that putting a shop here was a good idea. Like, I feel like Link is his one and only customer for sure. To even get to this guy, you have to use your hover boots, which is pretty inconvenient if you ask me. This guy only sells one item, the bomb shoes, for quite an expensive price I might add, and I find it kind of sus that he doesn't tell you what the item is until you actually purchase it. 
not exactly the most trustworthy businessman. For the weirdest character in this game, I'll have to choose the famous windmill hut guy named Guru Guru, or Phonogram Man, who cranks his music box in time with a windmill spinning. And if you play the Song of Storms, the windmill spins faster, and the guy gets upset that it's spinning too fast. This guy is super weird in a random kind of way, where I guess he's just an eccentric music lover who likes to play his music box in beat with a windmill spinning. Also, this guy signifies an interesting phenomenon called a closed loop paradox, where before you learn the Song of Storms, when you go up to him as an adult, he talks about how an ocarina kid, aka Young Link, played the Song of Storms in the windmill as a kid, which made him upset. At this point, he teaches you the Song of Storms as an adult, but if Link originally learned the song as an adult, how could he have possibly played it to the guy as a kid seven years prior? Time travel is impossible anyway, but this really gets you thinking. Also, I just kind of think this guy looks shifty looking, like he's up to no good. I'm not sure what that hag from Zelda's adventure was thinking, but I'm not going to trust the bold Zelda characters either. Now let's go out to the next game. Next, with The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask, also released for the Nintendo 64. And man, this game probably has the densest collection of weird Zelda characters in all the mainline Zelda games. The first honorable mention goes to Kamaru, who is a bubble-bellied ghost that can only be found at night in Termina Field, doing some goofy-looking dance on a mushroom. If Link is so kind as to play the Song of Healing for the guy to ease his soul, he gives you the Kamaru Mask, which allows Link to wear Kamaru's face on himself, and that somehow allows him to be in a perpetual state of doing that same odd Kamaru dance that he's infamous for. Another weird character is the Happy Mask Salesman himself, who is hella creepy looking, but is actually really helpful in Link's quest to save Termina from Majora. Not much is known about the origins of the Happy Mask Salesman, but I feel like he has to be some sort of powerful wizard magic guy. He's a protector of one of the most evil and corrupted items in Zelda history, and I find it kind of weird how he sometimes talks to Link as if he knows a lot about him already, where he says that retrieving Majora's Mask should be of no difficulty for someone like him. That sort of implies that the Happy Mask Salesman is some sort of omniscient being, either that, or he stalks Link all the time. I also think that he acts weird in the end credits, where he sort of just disappears into thin air before your own very eyes. Like there's no way this guy isn't some sort of magician or something. My last honorable mention that I won't dwell on too much, because it's kind of obvious, is the man, the myth, the 35 year old man-child fairy guy, Tingle. He has a goofy catchphrase, strange costume, and you honestly have to have a bit of pity for this sad, sad man. He thinks he's a reincarnation of a fairy, and even his own father in the game refers to Tingle as a child, and is disappointed at his immaturity. For the number one weirdest character in the game, I'll have to go with the disembodied hand that you can find in the stockpot inn at night that asks for paper in exchange for a piece of heart. Or honestly, it's probably not a disembodied hand, because I'm guessing it's using the paper to clean up something somewhere downstairs. Even the game sort of indirectly declares this thing as weird, where in the Bomberman's notebook, the name for the hand just shows up as three question marks. You may know this already, but the origin of this thing in the game came from Japanese ghost stories, where in those stories, ghost hands come out of the toilet and grab at you. This is literally a theory that I made up, but I sort of think that the hand in the toilet might just be Beetle crouching down in there, because the voice lines between the hand in Majora's Mask and Beetle from The Wind Waker are so similar. Just listen to this. Oh! Bye! Yay! You can't tell me those are two different voice actors. And honestly, Beetle doesn't seem like the most normal guy, as you'll see later in this video, so it's not like I'd be totally surprised if I actually saw him down there. Anyway, let's go on to the next game. The next game we have to cover is Oracle Seasons, released for the Game Boy Color. The NPCs from this game aren't too crazy, but one that kind of stood out to me as being strange and takes the honorable mention spot is the winged bear looking companion with wings, named Moosh. He sort of looks more in place in a Pokemon game, and there's no way in heck a big ass bear that size could fly with wings like those. I know that Nintendo released Oracle of Ages and Seasons at the same time to mimic the successful Pokemon games, so maybe they incorporated these Pokemon-esque looking animal buddies to sort of mimic and pay homage to those series of games. For the weirdest character in this game though, I'll have to go with someone named the Sign-Loving Sabrosian, who you can find in this house in the Sabrosia area of the game. This guy is obsessed with signs, to the point that he'll give Link the sign ring once he breaks 100 signs to remind him of his quote unquote mistake. This ring actually has no effect at all, and I honestly think it's kind of creepy that the sign loving Sabrosian guy is stalking Link from behind, just out of sight, keeping track of how many signs he has broken along his adventure. Like talk about a crazy person. Now let's go on to the next game. Next up, we have the counterpart to Oracle Seasons, Oracle of Ages, which also released for the Game Boy Color. This game has a lot of weird characters that I talked about from Majora's Mask, where we have the Happy Mask Salesman, Toilet Hand Guy, and Tingle. One new NPC that seems kind of strange, just based on looks alone, is Grandma, who looks like her face is sliding off her skull. That's pretty much the only thing weird about her, but they really did this lady dirty with a pixel art here. For the weirdest NPC in the game though, I'll go with this guy named Thomas, who wants Link to give him a dumbbell as part of the game's trading sequence, because apparently it goes against his policies to just work out with the one dumbbell he has. 
Why does it go against his policies? The world may never know. This guy is just an oddball. Also, he has somewhat of a mild obsession with getting the girls, where he wants to work out more in order to attract them, due to his small build. Also, what tops the cake for this guy is that he can be found in Symmetry Village, which is a village that's a mirror image of itself, split down the middle, and each inhabitant has their own twin. Definitely one of the stranger areas in Zelda. Now let's move on to the next game. Next, we have Four Swords, which is a multiplayer game that was released for the Game Boy Advance. We don't have many NPCs to choose from for this one, where pretty much the only characters are the different links, Zelda, and all these stray fairies that fly around. The weirdest character goes to a variation of these fairies, called the Great Fairies, which can be found throughout the game as you beat certain areas. Their role in this game is to give Link keys, and the quality of those keys are based on how many rupees you collect in the game, or the more rupees you collect, the better key you will get. The weird aspect of these great fairies lie within the dialogue of the worst key reward when you barely collect any rupees, where they call you little eggs waiting to hatch into heroes, which is honestly kind of a put down. Like I'd be pissed if I came all this way, slaying great monsters and beasts, just to be called a delicate little egg. Who do these fairies think they are? Anyway, let's move on to the next game. Next up, we have The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker, released for the GameCube. For my first honorable mention for the weirdest character, I'll have to go with Beetle, the OG. And no, I did not choose him because of me thinking that he may be that hand from Majora's Mask. He's honestly one of the most lovable characters in all of Zelda, and just seems like a chill and nice dude, but he seems a bit obsessed with his business, and a bit obsessed with Link. I guess he's well aware that Link is his number one customer, and probably only customer, so as you're sailing around the Great Sea, you constantly run into this guy. Even when there's dangerous sea creatures around, he'll be right there at your assistance. I guess you sort of have to admire his dedication. I also think it's funny how he has an alter ego, called Beetle's assistant, that you can come across, who wears a mask as a disguise, but it's obvious that he's still the same Beetle. In masked form, he pretends to not recognize Link, but he only does this as a marketing ploy, where he says he's holding a clearance sale, and that the shop will close in 7 days, but instead of closing the store, he holds a grand reopening sale, where the prices are no different from before, which is honestly pretty hilarious. I can't even get mad. Beetle's hustling. Another honorable mention weird character is this guy named Tot, for obvious reasons. He calls himself the world's most charismatic dancer extraordinaire, and he can even be found dancing in front of a tombstone on Windfall Island. I guess he's supposed to be an Elvis reference, but there's no doubt this guy has lost his mind. He's kind of on tingle levels of weirdness. For the strangest NPC in this game, I'll have to go with Maggie, who can also be found on Windfall Island. And man, she has a wild character arc. She starts out as a poor girl who gets kidnapped by the Helmrock King. Once Link comes to the Forsaken Fortress to save his sister, Errol, he also saves Maggie, who comes back to her father to Windfall Island. She comes back with wealth though, where during her time in the Forsaken Fortress, she formed romantic relations with a moblin named Mo, who gave her a bunch of skull necklaces. She then goes to sell these skull necklaces, which causes her and her father to become extremely rich. Maggie misses her lover, Mo, however, so she sends letters to him, and Link is even able to catch a glimpse at one of these letters from Mo, where Mo writes in broken English that he loves Maggie so much that he could eat her for dinner, and honestly, the contents of that letter being deemed as concerning is an understatement. Maggie, the Stockholm Syndrome victim, interprets that letter as a marriage proposal, but she never leaves Windfall Island to go after Mo because she doesn't want to leave her father, which is honestly probably for the best. So with that, let's move on to the next game. Next up, we have another GameCube Zelda game, The Legend of Zelda Four Swords Adventures. This game actually has quite a bit of characters for a multiplayer party-like Zelda game, where the weirdest goes to the lonely old man. In many Zelda games, dating back to the very first on the NES, the old man is a character that has wisdom and helps Link out on his journey. In this game, however, the old man is a lonely, sad individual who is jealous of the four Links for being friends with each other. In conjunction with his jealousy, you oftentimes find him spitting useless dialogue that has no benefit to Link in his quest whatsoever, such as here in the graveyard, where he ponders if he's actually alive or dead as a ghost. He does sometimes give helpful information though, where he can give hints on how to proceed through certain areas of the game. It's just weird to see in a Zelda game, an NPC talk about their inner turmoils that don't directly reflect some sort of quest or task that the player has to fix. And honestly, you kind of have to feel bad for the guy. So now, let's move on to the next game. Next, we have a handheld game of The Legend of Zelda The Minish Cap, released for the Game Boy Advance. For the honorable mention spot for the weirdest character, I'll have to go with one that's actually a ghost, Spookster, who can be found in Hyrule Town. Despite what his name suggests, he's actually not scary at all, even though he keeps trying to scare Link earlier on in the game, which is honestly pretty hilarious. Throughout your quest, he actually becomes increasingly more disinterested in scaring people, and actually gets scared himself after Vadi transforms Hyrule Castle into Dark Hyrule Castle, which is pretty ironic. 
For the weirdest NPC, I'll have to go with the rather obscure one, the Monster Lady, who is actually a bow moblin in disguise. This lady can be found in Percy's house, and when you try to talk to her, she says that she likes the dark. When Link turns on the lights with his lantern, her true identity gets revealed, and she gives you some rupees so that you don't tell anyone about her secret. This whole scenario is super strange and unexpected, where it's not very common in Zelda games to have a low-level enemies like bow moblins speak and do things in a human-like manner. This seems to be a callback to the secret moblin from Zelda 1, who gives you rupees to keep it a secret from everybody, where it's clear that the moblin in the Minish Cap is tired of his evil ways and just wants to settle down in a peaceful and harmless life. The monster lady's eyes are also super creepy looking, where they're just plain white, which I guess serves as a hint that something's often potentially sinister about her. Other than that, you kind of have to give the moblin some props for having such a good disguise. So with that, let's move on to the next game. Next up, we have a Tingle spin-off game of freshly picked Tingle's Rosy Ruby Land, which released for the DS. If you don't already know, this game is very weird. I mean, the main character is Tingle, so you already know this one's gonna be a trip. Pretty much every character has their own weird quirks about them, but a group of them that takes the cake for me as the strangest is the Bridge Building Brothers, which are a group of brothers that look and act almost the same. Their weirdness can honestly be summed up by their little character animation alone, where they can be seen humping the air. And yes, somehow Nintendo was able to get away with releasing this game with a 12 and up rating, believe it or not. These scandalously dressed construction workers sort of resemble male strippers, but among the brothers, there is actually a sister who is super masculine and somehow looks exactly like the rest of the brothers, except she has pink overalls, but somehow still has a mustache. This whole band of builders is just strange, and seems more at place in a circus, but they are very helpful in helping you finish your quest, where they build a lot of bridges that you need to traverse from place to place. Now let's go on to the next game. Now we have The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess, released for the GameCube and Wii. This game can seem super dark and serious on the surface level, but it has a heck of a lot of strange and sometimes goofy NPCs that you have to interact with on your adventure. One of these that takes an honorable mention spot for me is Mallow, a toddler genius entrepreneur who somehow found a way to run his own thriving business in Castletown. Granted, his business ventures are probably solely funded by Link with his thousands of rupees to construct some of his shops, but he does offer the player a decent amount of useful and exclusive items to help you on your journey. Probably the most absurd aspect about this character is a spectacle of the shop that he constructs in Castletown. How it looks very much reflects an idea that a child would create, with all these bright lights and an annoying but catchy song, but he has a heck of a lot of customers in there, so it worked out for him, it looks like. Another honorable mention for the weirdest character, which sort of classifies as an item as well, is the Uku and Uku Jr. combo, who are father and son that can be found in dungeons to allow you to warp out of them. These creatures are members of a species in the city in the sky, called the Uka, which are basically the kinds of things that you'd see in nightmares. This isn't really confirmed or anything, but I think the Uka might be the evolved form of the residents of Skyloft from Skyward Sword, considering that Skyloft and the city in the sky are both floating islands. The events of Twilight Princess happened centuries after the events of Skyward Sword, which could allow for this transformation to take place. Also, there aren't really many residents of Skyloft, so after a few generations, they probably all ended up being siblings with each other. And we all know what happens when close relatives repeatedly have kids with each other. We get monstrosities like these. Also, if we went to go further with this theory, the Uka species looks to be a cross between birds, since they have feathers and can fly, and humans because they can speak English and have humanoid faces. So they could be a cross between the two species that are most prevalent in Skyloft. Actually, no, scratch that. I don't even want to think about that disturbing possibility. The Uka are weird creatures, and we'll just leave it at that. For the weirdest character in this game, I'll have to go with the Princess of the Insect Kingdom, Agatha, who is a 10-year-old girl that lives in Castletown alone. Despite being 10 and living alone, she's pretty well off, as whenever Link brings a new species of bug to her, she gives him a fat stack of rupees. She seems rather delusional, though, where her weirdness really shines in her dialogue that she exchanges with Link. She wants to collect the bugs so that they can participate in her bug party, and when you have bugs on you that you can sell to her, and if you deny selling them, she growls and somehow senses that you have bugs and are withholding them from her, which is a bit disturbing. Also, she has a weird piece of dialogue when you give her the stag beetle, where she says, Your spiky pinchers are so sharp, they must feel so good, which is definitely a concerning thing to hear from anyone, let alone a 10 year old. Anyway, let's go on to the next game. The next game is The Legend of Zelda Phantom Hourglass, released for the DS. I have one honorable mention for the weirdest character that I want to cover, where we have the Man of Smiles, who can be found sailing in his colorfully decorated ship by himself. When you enter his ship, the door closes behind you and a bunch of enemies appear. After you kill all of them, the door opens up and the guy appears. The first time you visit him, he gives you the hero's new clothes, which starts the game's training sequence, as well as a treasure map. That's pretty much all the information we know about this guy, but the more you read between the lines, the creepier and stranger this guy seems. First of all, why the heck is the inside of his ship decorated like a kindergarten classroom? This guy's a grown-ass man. I'm guessing he just likes to paint for fun, but he seems a bit too smiley for a normal person, and he kind of gives off those happy mask salesman vibes from Majora's Mask. 
For the strangest NPC, I'll go with probably the character with the weirdest name in the entire Zelda franchise, Hoiger Haugendugan. Even this guy has trouble pronouncing his own name, where when you talk to him, he accidentally bites his tongue because it's a tongue twister to say. You can find Hoiger on a ship with his tribe of buddies, the Ho Ho tribe, and you can see that he doesn't have a telescope like the rest of his friends. During Link's quest, Link will come across the kaleidoscope, and when you talk to Hoiger with it, he'll express that the kaleidoscope has his name on it, and he'll give you another item in the trading sequence in exchange for it. At this point, you realize the entire Ho Ho tribe is just looking through kaleidoscopes instead of telescopes, where the room they are in doesn't even have windows that are open to the sea. The Ho Ho tribe, which fittingly starts every sentence with Ho Ho, say that they are exploring the land in search of treasure, but they are actually just looking through kaleidoscopes the entire time. How very bizarre. Also, I think it's kind of interesting that each member has a bloodshot eye that they're using to look through their kaleidoscope, as if they're so into their work that they can't even be bothered by taking blinking breaks. But honestly, whenever they have plans, I hope they find what they're looking for. So let's move on to the next game. For the next game, we have Deki Sugi Tingle Pack, which is a DSiWare game that was exclusive for Japan. For those that don't know, this game is sort of just a collection of basic tingle-related minigames, such as an alarm clock, fortune teller, and coin flipper that could pretty much just be used to pass time whenever you're super bored. The only character in this game besides Tingle is actually pretty weird, where we have the fortune teller lady, who looks to be Chico's mom from Tingle's Rosie Ruby Land. I've talked about this lady before already in my Weirdest Enemies video, where I classified her as an enemy due to her sinister collection of Tingle skulls sitting on her table, but she can also be considered a character because she verbally interacts with the player and hosts this fortune teller minigame. The Tingle skulls obviously make her weird, but she also looks very strange with her creepy eyes and weird lip movements, and I'm not sure if she's human or some sort of pale frog type creature. Also, she does this weird thing, where she moves each of her pupils around independently when you mix around the cards with your stylus, which I find a bit unsettling. Anyway, let's just move on to the next game. Next up, we have Ripen Tingle's Balloon Trip of Love, which is another Japanese exclusive that's the last Tingle game that we'll cover on this list. Being a similar style to freshly picked Tingle's Rosie Ruby Land, you already know there's bound to be some strange characters in this game. For the weirdest, I'd say that has to go to a robot-looking NPC who's literally named Liar. In this game, you have to journey around and attract different love interests in order to progress, and Liar is one of these females, or I'm not sure if you can even consider this doorknobs for hand creature to be female, but that's besides the point. As our girl's name suggests, she has a bit of a lying problem, which is common amongst her people, the Usutami. This character is so absurd, because why Tingle would fall for a girl where lying is literally part of her identity is beyond me. Like I know Tingle is a weird 35 year old man child, and beggars can't be choosers, but I feel like he could do better. Whatever. At least it kind of works out between the two. But when it seems like she compliments Tingle, calling him a hunk, she's actually lying because she always lies. But Tingle can sort of pretend like she's telling the truth, and feel good about himself. Alright, let's move on to the next game. Now we have The Legend of Zelda Spirit Tracks for the DS. Now there's a huge range of living things that you can come across in Zelda games. There's the bird people of the Rito tribe, the average everyday human hillion, and there's just plain old dumb animals. And what do we get when we merge two of these groups together? Welp, we've got a furry. Yes, in Spirit Tracks, the weirdest character goes to this furry dressed up as a rabbit who calls himself Bunnyo. Bunnyo is obsessed with rabbits, so obsessed in fact, that he created a train station called Rabbit Land Rescue, where he houses wild rabbits that Link finds throughout his adventure. So basically, this guy is a goofball, and it's hard to take him seriously. There is a bit of irony that exists with our guy Bunnyo though, where once you've returned all 50 rabbits to him that are found throughout all 5 realms, he gives you the ancient fabled Swordsman Scroll, which allows Link to shoot sword beams from his sword at full health. How such a goober came across such a powerful skill is beyond me, but at least he makes hunting down all these rabbits worthwhile. In terms of Bunnyo's love life outside of Bunnyhood, he is actually married to a lady named Mona, who can be found in Castletown. At a certain point in the game, Mona asks Link to help her search for her lost husband, where you're able to transport her on the train to Rabbit Lane Rescue. Once reunited with her husband, Mona chastises Bunyu for abandoning her, claiming that he loves rabbits more than her, but she agrees to stay with him, because apparently it's his love for animals that made her interested in him in the first place. It's honestly pretty crazy that Mona stayed with him, considering that he literally ghosted her to play with rabbits. Like, that's on a whole nother level of disrespect. Anyway, the characters only get stranger from here, so let's move on to the next game. Next, we have The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword, which was released for the Wii. This game has some interesting character designs, especially for the NPCs in Skyloft, where most, if not all of them, are representations of some type of bird, where a lot of the characters look somewhat bird-like, and oftentimes even have names that sound like a bird species. Some examples of this are Groose being named after Goose, Aegis being named after Eagle, and Goalie being named after Goal, like a seagull. 
One of the most absurd characters in Skyloft that takes the honorable mission spot as the weirdest NPC goes to Dodo, the eccentric clown guy, whose name closely resembles the Dodo bird. Yes, named after the species of birds that's known for being the most stupid. So this guy is a clown, no pun intended, and he hosts a minigame on Fun Fun Island where he shoots you hundreds of feet in the air with a cannon, and you have to fly through rings to try and win rupees. Sounds eerily similar to these guys. So the minigame consists of you plummeting to the ground as you have to avoid these large creepy looking balls with his face plastered on them. He doesn't take the weirdest character spot though, where that title has to go to the scary, the creepy, the terrifying, the almighty, the ungodly, the cowardly and innocent but true, who is a humanoid bat demon guy living at the underbelly of Skyloft. You first come across him during a quest, where you had to find a lost child, and once you look around Batru's house, you can hear the kids screaming bloody murder, but it turns out that they were just playing a game called Scream As Loud As You Can, as Link is seconds away from embedding his sword between Batru's caterpillar eyebrows. Like, I can't even make this up. This guy is asking to be put on some kind of list playing a game like that with a lost child. Anyway, once you meet him, Betru tells you that he doesn't want to be a demon anymore, and that Link needs to find all the gratitude crystals throughout Hyrule in order to break the curse and turn him back into a human again. Once Link does that, Betru's pair of wings and horns fall off, and well, he honestly looks pretty much the same. Anyway, he then thanks the player and enjoys his human life in the Skyloft Bazaar, free from Skyloftian judgment. Skyloftian? Pretty sure I just made up that word. Anyway, let's move on to the next game. Next up, we have a handheld entry of The Legend of Zelda A Link Between Worlds, which was released for the 3DS. For an honorable mention weird character, I'll have to choose a very minor, yet obscure one, that you're bound to miss, where we have this guy that we can just call Bad Guy, who is a guy in low rule in Thieves Town that can be found inside the item shop with a burlap sack over his head. What's under that perfectly cylindrical head of his? Nobody knows. And honestly, I kind of thought he was a piece of corn the first time I saw him. The guy doesn't really do much though, where he just sings to himself and talks about the town for a bit. I am curious as to what he's hiding under that dome of his though, and what his actual identity is. He could be Tingle's long lost brother, Dingle, for all we know. Yeah, let's just go with that. For the weirdest character in the game, I'll go with Rumor Guy, who tells Link random bits of knowledge that are useless and rather absurd, which all revolve around some sort of rumor that may or may not be true. He tells you things such as the fortune teller's failed love life, how he apparently stole 80 year old Gramps from Kakariko Village, doing a handstand with one finger, and he even admits to the player that he repetitively stalks Princess Zelda through her window, staring at her looking at a picture of a princess embracing a hero. Honestly, it kind of makes sense why this guy lives so secluded from everyone in one of the further reaches of Hyrule. Nobody likes a guy who spreads rumors. Despite this, I have to admit that I kind of get a kick out of the guy. He has a cheesy grin with those goofy sunglasses on, despite him being in a dark cave, and his haircut makes him look like DW from Arthur. What also makes this character so strange to me is why Nintendo decided to make him a character in the first place. He's not beneficial towards the player's progress whatsoever, so I guess his inclusion was just to provide the player with some comic relief if they were able to find his secret house. Also, this guy could just be the result of the devs having fun amongst themselves, trying to make the most absurd looking, and a goofy acting side character that they could possibly think of, and this guy definitely threw me for a loop the first time I saw him. So now let's move on to the next game. For the next game, we have Hyrule Warriors, which initially released for the Wii U, and was later released for the Switch. This game mostly has characters brought over from other Zelda games, such as Darunia, Tingle, and Agatha, but one new character in this game that takes the weirdest spot goes to Sia, a powerful evil sorceress who serves as one of the main villains in the game. Her strangeness is summed up by one main quality, her absolute obsession towards Link, where her main motive for turning evil is a desire to claim Link as her own. When you fight her, she even uses Dark Links as a form of attack, and in her castle, she even has massive statues of Link built in his honor. Absolute crazy person energy, I know. Her jealousy of Princess Zelda, combined with the corruptive powers of Ganondorf, caused her to spawn thousands and thousands of monsters to capture Link, as well as take over the world. She gets defeated by Link and his allies by the end of the game, like how these games usually go, but you can't deny how crazy her goal is to claim Link, stopping anything that gets in her way. Now let's move on to the next game. Now we have Triforce Heroes, released for the 3DS. Similar to the other multiplayer Zelda games, this game doesn't boast a huge roster of characters, but I find it pretty funny how it reuses a lot of the same character models from A Link Between Worlds while giving people different names. Like the rumor guy got transformed into the photo bro who hosts the Miiverse gallery when Miiverse used to be a thing. So now he doesn't really have much of a purpose and just talks to the player in outdated slang. For the strangest character, I'll go with Madame Couture, the clothes shop owner who's obsessed with fashion as well as her cats. 
Her over-the-top dialogue and annoying random shrieks seem a bit off the wall, but I guess that sort of fits the atmosphere of this game. She does also have an interesting fashion taste though, where she sells some odd outfits to Link, where some notable ones are the Rupee Regalia, which gives me Dodo flashbacks, the Timeless Tunic, which turns Link into Steve from Minecraft, and the Zora costume, which just looks like Link's peeking out of the corpse of a dead Zora. All of these costumes have some sort of advantage while worn, but you can't deny how strange it is to see a gang of three links walking around a monster-infested dungeon with cheerleader outfits on. Moving on to the next game. Now we have the one and only Breath of the Wild, released for the Wii U and Switch. I didn't count how many characters are in this game exactly, but there has to be at least a couple hundred, which took quite a while to filter through to choose the strangest. As no surprise to many, for my honorable mention spot, I chose Hestu, the forest-dwelling Korok who dances around with the signature maracas as you give more and more Korok seeds to him. While his dance is kind of odd and gets a bit old after the first 20 times, his main weirdness stems from the gift he gives you when you collect all 900 Korok seeds. A steaming pile of poop, deemed Hestu's gift. The game doesn't straight up tell you it's poop, but it's heavily implied, with the item text that reads, A gift of friendship given to you by Hestu. It smells pretty bad. And the best thing of all is that it serves no purpose, except you can watch Hestu dance whenever you want to now, as if we needed to watch him dance for the 53rd time. This character does not take the weirdest spot in the game though, where that title goes to Magda, the crazy flower lady, who planted a huge elaborate garden of flowers and scolds Link for stepping on them. Now Link is pretty much the human lawnmower of Hyrule, so when he steps on her flowers too many times, she straight up attacks Link to make sure he understands the quote unquote, flowers rage. This lady is absolutely absurd and it's crazy how someone can be so upset about a flower bed when the real threat looming over everybody is Ganon's control of Hyrule. Every time she attacks you, she does 3 hearts of damage, but if you try stepping on her flowers with less than 3 hearts left, she can't actually kill you, which I guess makes this lady a little bit less insane. Like imagine killing someone over stepping on your flowers. Even when you get kicked out of Gerudo Town in this game, they at least have the decency to not injure Link. Anyway, let's move on to the next game. Next up is Cadence of Hyrule Crypt of the Necrodancer, released for the Switch. I'll just cut to the chase with this one and declare Frederick the Shopkeeper as the weirdest character in this game, who hosts shops all throughout Hyrule that the player can visit to purchase items. In order to find his shop, you have to follow his voice, which is a pretty cool feature, but what makes this guy so strange and interesting is that you can actually attack the guy and he can fight back. If the player hurts him with a bomb, very specific I know, he goes on full berserk mode and tries to kill you. He could actually kill you if you're not careful, but if you manage to kill him, he'll disappear and drop a coupon, which can be used to buy an item for free from a shop. Now Frederick isn't the only shopkeeper in this game, so you could just use the coupon in another shop to get a free item, but if you try and use the coupon in one of Frederick's shops, he'll apparently be reminded of you killing him for it, and he'll try to attack you again, where you can just keep picking off each Frederick one by one for the sweet, sweet free items. This is a pretty funny and weird easter egg, where when Frederick sings, he hints to the player that bombs are his weakness, and to watch where you place your bombs. Be careful though, because a lot of these guys in certain locations won't respawn at all when you kill them, which is honestly kind of dark and sad, the more you think about it. Like normal enemies in Zelda respawn when you leave the room and enter it again, but you have this actual human with a name that's able to be killed off permanently when the player chooses. Anyway, let's move to the next weird character to talk about. Now we have Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity, which was released for the Switch. Similar to the original Hyrule Warriors game, this game doesn't have very many unique characters. However, one reused character from Zelda games that takes the weirdest character spot for this game goes to the Great Fairy. These things are weird in Breath of the Wild, where they do some unmentionable things to Link under the surface of their water holes, no pun intended, but at least in Breath of the Wild, those things were stationary. In Age of Calamity, they can follow you around because apparently it's possible to transport a body of water and put you in a world of pain in the process. Like I was shocked when I saw these things for the first time trying to attack me, as they transport their pond around like some earthbender. Also later on in the game, you can actually unlock the Great Fairies as a playable character, which is pretty cool yet rather absurd. Like I don't know about you, but I would crap my pants if I saw this creature hovering towards me in real life, with his large bodybuilder biceps and plastered on maniacal smile. Alright, now let's move on to the last game. Last but not least, we have The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom for the Switch. Similar to Breath of the Wild, this game is absolutely massive and took a while to look through the long list of characters in order to find the strangest. One honorable mention weird character that you'll end up encountering fairly early on in the game is the one and only, or should I say multiple and many, since there are 81 locations of this guy all around Hyrule, Addison, the sign guy, who you have to help hold up his sign in exchange for various gifts. When I first came across this guy, I thought he had like a dozen identical brothers, since he always seems to be around where Link is, but there's actually one of this guy, I'm pretty sure. 
This guy is pretty absurd because he's prepared enough to pack meals for himself and share with the player, but he has yet learned how to support a sign, despite Link showing him over and over countless times. Also, I don't know why he doesn't just get someone to hold the sign steady as he secures it, instead of having Link balance some elaborate glued together conglomerate of boulders under the sign. Also, a lot of the signs literally have a spike at the bottom of them that he holds, so I don't know what's stopping him from just pushing it into the ground. So you have to play Addison's little game of Art of Balance, in exchange for his various meal variants of rice balls. Like honestly, I don't understand this guy's obsession with rice balls. For the weirdest character in this game, I'll go with Colton, who is a weird goblin guy that's Kilton's younger brother, where Kilton was a guy who initially made his debut in Breath of the Wild. In Tears of the Kingdom, Colton serves one main purpose, and that's to eat the remnants of dead cave frogs that Link brings him in the hopes of turning into a variant of one. Also, apparently this guy has an iron stomach, because he'll eat a whopping total of 147 Babol gems until he gives you the final reward. Skip ahead a bit if you don't want the reward spoiled, but I was pretty shocked when I saw it for the first time. Yes, he turns into one of those bloopy rabbit things. The same things that Link can mercilessly pierce with arrows in exchange for rupees. So now instead of wolfing down frog parts, he can now be hunted by Link for his wallet's satisfaction. Also, whenever you visit Colton's little area, you can find a gang of bloopies, which I like to think are Colton and his little gang of buddies. Alright, that's the weirdest character from almost every single Zelda game to be released. I didn't bring up some Zelda games in this video, because some just don't have any weird characters, where most of the games that I left off in this video didn't have any characters besides Link and Zelda themselves. And those two are probably the most generic Zelda characters out there. I have all the games listed here on the screen that I didn't bring up because of this, in order to not bore you guys, but they're on the screen, in case you were curious. But I think that's all I have to talk about for this video, so make sure to subscribe to not miss out on future videos like this, where I talk about Zelda games, and bring up aspects about these games that you probably have never heard of before. So with that, I'll see you in the next one.